Here we go. Yeah, okay, great. I'm just leaving. All right, great. Well, thank you all for uh, joining our session where we're going to talk about uh, smart cities and digital privacy. We have a super duper world class panel here <laughs> of famous people uh, who are really shaping the, uh, the future. Uh, we have uh, Floyd Kephart, chairman of the Renaissance Group, uh, Ro Rosanna Wong uh, from, the, uh, uh, from Hong Kong, one of the leading smart city developers, and Matthias Bergstorm. Uh, who uh, has developed, invented a new way to manage uh, smart cities that is not only more economical, but more private. Um, this uh, session is being recorded and will be distributed uh, after the event. So the, the goal here is uh, we're going to uh, talk about the, the future opportunities and challenges cities and really our, our focus is going to be on how do we balance uh, privacy with the information needed to optimize because if we think about smart cities the, the real benefit is on the uh, managing of the traffic in real time so people are not wasting fuel uh, stuck at red lights also managing energy so that you know buildings aren't uh, turned on uh, but the challenge is with, with all of this, there's a, there's a privacy issue and there's a cyber issue. Uh, you know, how do we make sure that all of these systems uh, kind of uh, work properly? So with that, I wanted to start with uh, uh, Floyd Kephart. Floyd is uh, a global investor. Uh, he has been looking at uh, smart cities as an investment vehicle and wanted to kind of start off with him and basically just look at uh, what the opportunity he sees for smart cities uh, as an investor, uh, but what are the also the challenges he's looking for in terms of profitability? Because one of the things uh, I've learned speaking to Floyd, and, and Floyd uh, has been a good teacher for me, <laughs> is he, he once told me that uh, the Renaissance Group, everything has to be a profit center. Uh, he said uh, in his projects, nothing is a, is a cost center. And I think that's a kind of good model for smart cities where you have all of these components and he's expecting each one of these components to kind of make money. So with that, Floyd would want some pieces of insight from you on, you know, what you see as the opportunity, what you see as the challenge, the need for profitability and also the need for privacy. Well, thanks, Sinead, and, and I appreciate being on the on the panel with uh, Pete, a lot of people who are smarter than I am. Um, the The issue is there is a change in business models that's taking place worldwide, and that change in business models is some type of service. Uh, and wh what we're finding is is that historically infrastructure within cities has been run by the public. And today, infrastructure as a service is now a business model. And mm -hmm. infrastructure as a service is being privately financed instead of publicly financed, primarily in public-private partnerships, where you're providing this service to the public, but you, in fact, uh, own it as a private entity. And the challenges that that creates with privacy is that all of a sudden, the information that has been held by the public on an individual basis, whether it's your electric bill or your transportation bill, your mobility bill, whatever that is, is now transferred to the private industry mm -hmm. with infrastructure as a service. So how do you protect that? Uh, and, and what's the distribution of that? Because what we know is, is that in the private sector, data is a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. The selling of data is a major revenue stream today. And where does that stop? Where does private industry's ability to utilize the data as a revenue stream, as opposed to protecting the individual's right to privacy, take place? And that is now becoming a component in the negotiations with cities and states where you're now talking about we'll provide 
a microelectric grid. We'll provide a new infrastructure for you for mobility. We'll provide new communications for you. But in those negotiations, we get the rights to the data. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it is the utilization of that data and the privacy creation around that. that There is so much money today available within the private sector and so little amount of money available in the public sector, primarily as a result of COVID. But that's sitting there. And, and so now you have this onslaught of cities and states looking around and saying, well, I can now finance this privately. And with that, the ownership of public service is transforming from public to private. The data use is transforming from public to private. And so now how do we protect that and go forward? That's a real challenge within the privacy world. The financing world is going to rule in my judgment. The Mm -hmm. city, if they can get the utility financed privately, as opposed to them issuing another 25 year bond and it coming out of the general fund, they're going to do that. And that's going to be within nation states, within cities and so forth. And so developers like Rosanna here, they're going to take advantage of that and they're going to make those deals because tying into an infrastructure financing is also a revenue stream for them. And it cuts down on their soft cost. It cuts down on their development cost. So so that's what we see in it. And it's a real issue for us as we're installing infrastructure and saying, okay, how do we protect the data? How do we protect the privacy? And at what point do we draw a line? And, and it's, a, it's a societal question that, that will become an evolving answer because there is no right or wrong answer to that today. So uh, <clears throat> one question is, before we switch to Rosanna, I guess, you know, based on what you're saying, I, I, I also see an opportunity for the private sector to maybe do a better job of privacy than governments. Uh, I mean, just because as it's shifting, it doesn't mean things necessarily get worse. Maybe things could get better. Well, I think I think there's two ways that that can occur. The first is, is that private sector, because of its access to capital, is going to have the ability to institute new technology, technology such as XQ has, where you can protect and wrap data and keep that protected. Right. I mean, we're looking at ransomware around the world today, a hundred billion dollars transfers out of ransomware. Okay. It is the access to that private data that is causing that to take place. How do you protect that? So when the private sector, it's much more important to protect that data than it is in the public sector. And we have more resources to be able to do it. So we'll look, we'll, install new technologies much faster, we'll make the changes faster. And so from that standpoint, it's going to be a benefit to the privacy side. Great. So with that, you know, Rosanna, I'd like to kind of get your perspective. You're one of the uh, leading uh, smart building uh, builders, actually, in the in the world. You built one of the first uh, smart buildings in Hong Kong a decade ago. <laughs> so a true, true global leader. And uh, I, I guess my understanding is you just recently won a new project in uh, Hong Kong that you uh, basically uh, sold out. Uh, so it, it's uh, uh, really, really speaks to your brand and the and the uh, trust people have. Building on what Floyd has said, where he really sees the these new smart buildings as really infrastructures of service. Uh, I, I know when you create smart buildings. What what are your thoughts in making those buildings better for the the tenants, both the the business and the the people, in terms of uh, providing intelligent services? I know you have tried to integrate not only energy services but also transportation services like autonomous vehicles into your building. Can you speak to a little bit, kind of extending on Floyd's comments uh, as as you're actually the the actual builder? Of your thoughts. Uh, both the opportunity to create a living building, but also the challenges. And then um, what, what you also see, the cyber issues as well. 
Sure, I couldn't agree more what uh, what Freud was saying early on. Um, basically, I think from our story was started about at least fifteen years ago. We just felt up paying all this energy bill as a developer. We just felt like this is ridiculous. Yeah. So what we've done was we disrupt ourselves. We started all over again in terms of planning, design, and build to the whole processes, and again work with people globally in terms of hardware and software. So the end we thought was we build the um, Soho Hotel. As a developer uh, in in Hong Kong, we managed to save like two million kilowatt of energy per year, over two hundred and seventy four rooms. Basically, it's a high rise building. In order to do that, we really have to look into the material that we use. We use what we call BIM, building information modeling, but not just three D BIM. We use what we call five D BIM. We link through like four, which is the programming part. We can do optimizations as well. We link it through five D, which is the cost control. So the entire thing we call it full life cycle management. After we finish building the hotel, we can monitor it in terms of the facility management through、uh, the entire digitalize the entire process. Together, we put hundreds of sensors to monitor a hotel in terms of our water performance,、mm-hmm. our energy performance, and the green, because we want to recycle our rainwater in order to well through a filtration system to actually go back to our greeneries within the building itself. Imagine everything is like like building through boxes. So the entire things turn out to be quite、uh, reasonable in a sense that we save over what three point three million Hong Kong dollars per year, eight years without fail now. So that was then. So gradually we we、um, because of that we basically gain three extra companies. One is a hardware company, a very high coefficient hardware that we not only serve ourselves but other people too. And then in terms of energy optimizations, we have our own algorithm, real time monitoring. The entire thing. Again, we serve other people together with these BIM simulation solutions that we have. Again, we support open BIM, open source, open standard, globally. So we 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 really manage not just apply on the newly built development, but also in renovation. So one of our things that we've been doing for the last couple of years also renovate like existing uh, offices, uh, existing buildings. Again, we manage to transform over seventy percent of energy saving. So again, with the highest standard in terms of in the U.S., you call it LITS. We call platinum, and in terms of Hong Kong, we call it Hong Kong Beam Plus. We have platinum in Singapore. We call it Green Mark. We call it platinum in China. We call it three star. We achieve three stars. So in other words, the entire thing is proof. And again, the ROI is twenty five percent year on year. So I'm thinking it's no brainer that people should should do it basically. So this is the reason one of the reason why we turned that into business. So that is actually my core business at SEL Lead. But the other things I've been doing was I think I started my own venture funds four years ago, and now we have about twelve startups under our belt. It's all smart city related solutions, from planning to IoT devices, autonomous solutions,、uh, infrastructure, so on and so forth. And our vision is actually help build a sustainable、uh, smart city, and this is what we really wanted to do. And somehow we wrote our own blueprint. And people really liked it, so we turned that into an actual business plan. We call it Place of Tomorrow. This is something that I work very closely to my heart, which I shared with Janae early on. That we won the very first mobility as a service contract、uh, in Hong Kong Science Park. So basically, they got two、um, bought two autonomous solutions,、uh, two shuttles from us. A host for eight people is a level five. So basically, we go around the loop. Of our science park, people can just hop in, hop out, just book our our through our apps. The the entire thing will be monitored through a dashboard, so it's all real time. And this is what we have to do as a, as a service. But at the same time, we also do R and D as well with the local collaborators. We link it through five G in different five G service provider in order to advance what we do. So these ongoing things we do what we call V two V, V two X, and V two I link through our infrastructure. Those are the solutions that we've been working on. But in terms of、uh, building environment, we cracked、uh, one of our highlight, which I'm really dying to share with all of you, is that our、uh, uh, what we call MIC modular integrated construction. Globally, people call it DFMA, Design for Manufacturing Assembly. Basically, we design everything through BIM and then use AI robotic to manufacture everything else. So we we increase our productivity、uh, again. A lot cheaper, cut down fifty percent of our labor cost, and it's a lot faster, and the quality are far more better. So basically,、uh, in order to push that into a highest level, we link through our two D information through the RFID chip we implanted to our boxes, and then we color coded our beam modeling, and then the entire quality control we use blockchain to 
look into the entire thing from manufacturing to construction site. So this is what we call a BINI platform. And again, we run beautifully. So this is something that we really try to advance what we do. This is some of the highlights that um, I'd like to share with all of you. Well, well uh, you, you know, so, you know, it's kind of interesting, as Floyd talked about the transition from the public sector to the private sector. You know, one of the questions was, you know, can the private sector do a better job? Certainly from your perspective, the private sector is doing a way better job. <laughs> You've integrated energy management and transportation uh, all into your project uh, as a service. And uh, as, as you pointed out, if you're getting 25% return on investment, that's got to be the best deal on the planet. Uh, I, I was here to say that, Janae. <laughs> but this is something I, I, that I, I, like. I, I don't think you can get that uh, anywhere. So, uh, you know, with that, you know, I'd like to turn to uh, Matthias. Uh, Matthias is a kind of uh, famous person uh, around the world in Silicon Valley. Uh, he's uh, developed a lot of technologies that we use today. So, you know, Matthias, you've kind of heard, you know, Floyd talk about this uh, macro shift from uh, public to private as uh, I, I guess the, the investors have more faith in the private sector to manage these projects. And we've kind of heard from Roseanne, someone who's actually doing this, you know, with a kind of depth and uh, a kind of breadth in terms of speed that really is, is uh, I've never seen before. And, uh, you know, I have to give Roseanne a full credit. So one of the things we love your expertise and insight is how should all of this be managed? So it is, so privacy and cyber is built in, and also the profitability uh, with Rosanna <clears throat> uh, seeking 25% returns, uh, the, the infrastructure or the, the monetization has to kind of be built into it. So we just kind of love your thoughts on, um, again, from a technical perspective, the opportunities and challenges that you think need to be solved. Well, I mean, we've started from maybe another approach when we started building for um, smart cities or smart installations, smart nations, is about the amount of data, right? So mm -hmm. if we just take an intersection, an intersection produces enormous amounts of data with traffic compared to a building. A building is quite easy in the amount of data load per day compared to an intersection or a city. So... The goal became to cluster the computing on localized ways, right? Not having to move the data into a supercomputer somewhere to calculate it. This was first developed as a technique to weather with NOAA for doing weather predictions. So we could calculate a certain amount of the predictions, transform the data to information already at the stations, and then move them instead of moving everything um, to calculate the weather prediction. So the same model applies to smart cities mm -hmm. um, on a building per se you can work with centralized data but the bigger it gets the, the more data it requires the harder it becomes to manage it in that way and of course the profit opportunities are huge because with smart system we can optimize in all different direction but still keep the quality of life going but if we could instead start trading these resources, so let's say we have an intersection, the intersection has zero traffic. That means, of course, that we now have compute power just standing there, right? And that could be used for somewhere else where you have an overflow need of compute power. You can move that and utilize that compute power without having to go back again to the supercomputers. Instead, by clustered um, computing that can be spread in different ways. How to solve that with a different kind of marketplaces and different kind of how to do it is quite easy today using a blockchain kind of marketplace um, or trade station, right? I mean, it's a resource sharing algorithm. It's not brain surgery, right? So it all comes down to scale and amount of data in the end, right? We have all these positive effects that we can extract from this data, but we do have um, the problem of the amounts. And the amounts is also what creates our security and privacy issues. Because the more data you have, the more data you have to move, the more data you have to manage, 
the harder it becomes. Instead, if you transform that data to information early and then use it as information, the information has value and you store it in a more valuable sense, right? So uh, what we have done is built this decentralized clustering mm -hmm. system. So it's a tiered system of services. So you could say that, um, and I'm going to do a very simple example, <laughs> and I'll use a building. But you can say that each room has its own service. Each room is a service by mm -hmm. its own, but it has a parent service, which would be a house or an apartment, which has a parent service, which is a building, which has a parent service, which is an area, which has a parent that's a city. But all of these then in the building could be hundreds of units that mm -hmm. all contain computing power that can be spread around as needed, right? And of course, the management of this becomes more simple because it's decentralized. And we could talk about the quality of the data of sensors and how you can detect deviations in that and all of this, which becomes, which we say, autonomous out of this system. So one of the reasons this was developed, this tiered system, what's in reality, because we're working on a moon mining project and we realized it was the only way to manage the robots. They needed to be autonomous and they needed to have some kind of tiered system and they had to be decentralized because we couldn't be sending information from Earth, right? So that um, th the model came out of that, even though it implements certain things from um, decentralized operating system like the Sprite operating system from 1967, but that's a different story. <laughs> it's a very old operating. So, so based on your uh, concept of leveraging the compute as a resource, turning the smart city into a cloud, it seems one of the extensions is not only can compute power be sold, but you're talking about apartments, the same architecture could also sell the apartment, right? So you could use the same uh, uh, marketplace to both sell compute, but actually the actual asset, uh, which is the uh, yeah. apartments could make themselves available on the resource marketplace. The you, can decentralize, you can decentralize the trading point of many things. So if we look at one project we are looking into is how do you decentralize loading and offloading ships in the port, mm -hmm. which is quite an interesting thing because even if a ship needs to offload, he cannot buy that service today, right? So he has wares that are gonna go bad if he cannot offload this. There is no way the harbors do not have or the ports have no capability of letting him in before. He cannot trade. He cannot. Well, he can probably exchange with some other ship if it's possible, but it's going to be a hassle with customs. Right. So if you look at that as a trade possibility, they can trade the load and unload spots. Uh, then we get into quite an interesting thing. And that can happen decentralized. It doesn't need to be a brokerage service, right? You can do it over a decentralized platform. So that's one of the more interesting solutions for this, especially when it comes to uh, perishable goods. Because of course, if you're sitting there with a ship full of bananas, you really want to offload that, right? Before somebody who's sitting with cars, the cars will survive a week more, right? Great. So I'd, I'd like kind of open it up. And then for uh, those of you attending the session, feel free to Ask a question on the chat, and we also have the ability to turn on the microphone if you wish to speak. So, you know, really opening it up both to, you know, Rosanna and Floyd. And, you know, so given Mateus's, uh, so Mateus has kind of said kind of two interesting things. One is the smart city is its own cloud infrastructure that leveraging all of the compute power of all the sensors and gateways that they can actually handle their own computations. They don't have to send it somewhere else, which gives you security because you're not exporting the data, you're processing it locally, right? Maybe but, maybe to add one more thing, you do not need the internet, which is quite yes. an important factor. You're removing risk because you, you don't need the internet. You can't run it with only gateways to the internet, right? And then you can run your own protocol, whatever you want. You can run it on any protocol, basically, because you don't need to take the risk of being on the internet with such an infrastructure. Yeah, and and uh, given all those the uh, ransomware attacks, <laughs> I think Floyd just mentioned, uh, uh, happening, uh, certainly the ransomware attacks are happening across the open internet, 
you know, people connect and, and uh, certainly a self-contained smart city, smart building would be far more secure than the existing model where everything in the building is connecting to the internet, where you're just kind of asking for trouble. So I, I think a couple of things in Matthias's uh, thoughts, I think are, are kind of important. One, this notion of the, the value of being self-sufficient. I'm just paraphrasing him that the smart building or smart city is its own compute. It doesn't need the internet. It doesn't need external resources. But the other interesting thing that Matthias brought is this notion that not only compute, but even the space itself can be tradable, right? The uh, So Floyd, I, I know you, and, and again, this is a kind of open, uh, Rosanna would, Floyd, I, I know you have in your businesses looked at the opportunity to take a smart city and make it actually tradable within the city, everything from parking spots to apartments. Could you share some insight on, uh, as an investor, uh, what do you see or what do you want to see? What, what do you think is the potential upside for that? Because I, I know this, uh, you, you've been a kind of thought leader in this space here in the United States and globally on this as the kind of new way to think about real estate, not as just a building, but as a community of assets. Well, yeah, I mean, to, to a large degree, people look at things in a very isolated way. They see a building, it's a vertical structure, and they do not understand that it also has to be integrated within the community and it has to have interoperability among all of the services that take place. And what Mateus has done is really fascinating from the standpoint that where you can isolate areas and com- and control those at the same time, protect them, that becomes a valuable commodity to everybody within the community who's trying to share that information mm-hmm. or access that information. Uh, he's providing his own gateway. And whenever you can do that, then you can take away the risk factor from the actual operation, which is a huge thing. Uh, there's, a, there's an insurance company in Switzerland today who's looking into the ability to insure the operations of an entity if they can isolate the way the data flows. Yeah. And, and so when we look at all of this, we understand that that everybody who's on this, this Zoom today has the issue, how do we reduce risk? It is not necessarily how do we gain reward because we're going to gain reward every time we reduce risk. And in this factor, what Mateus is doing is saying this is one way to do this, and it is a way that covers all of the waterfront. Mm -hmm. Uh, On the backside of this, it has to be interoperable. So if, if Rosanna is working within a community, within her building, within her space that she's designed and is building, if she can isolate the risk factors within that and control the data that's rolling out of that, along with the ROI that's being generated, then from that standpoint, she has a way to reduce her own risk. The same way as we have the risk, if we integrate autonomous vehicles into the mobility as a service or transportation as a service, we we utilize the utilities to integrate everything else that's going on so that we're tracking everything. Because if we believe that the transition from combustible engines to electric vehicles are going to take place, then we know that it's going to be the management of the microelectric grids in the future that's going to become the core of utility. And how do you protect that? Well, you do that on the basis of what Mateus is saying. That's And, and it's a long way to say that think about everything as an integrated interoperable system, not a vertical standalone or silo operation in the future. Well, that's a great insight. So, uh, Rosanna, I kind of want to turn to you. You kind of got the two perspectives, uh, Floyd, with hundreds of millions of dollars uh, <laughs> looking for deals. Mateus, other people's money, though. Other, other people's, people's money. money. Even better, but, but, but he, he's, making sure they, he's making sure wealthy people get make even more money. <laughs> but uh, you, you, as the kind of uh, developer, builder, uh, and actually, you're also a system architect. For those of you who don't know, she, I've, I've had a chance to work with Rosanna. She's actually quite the engineer. <laughs> she knows a lot about uh, software and processes more, more than uh, uh, I, I'll actually a lot of engineers in Silicon Valley. 
So how do you, what, what do you see as the potential for kind of what Matthias talked about in terms of the building, not just being smart, but, you know, actually being kind of alive where the apartments in the building and since since you actually make buildings with smart apartments where the apartments are buying and selling compute, buying and selling energy, uh, but also buying and selling the apartment uh, as, as a tradable asset. I, I couldn't agree more with what you guys are saying, but I think right now my thoughts are monetizing spatial is something that it really turns me on. <laughs> I, I think because we, we live in such a small space in Hong Kong in particular. Right. So we need to really see what we can do in terms of our furnishing, our spatial, our spatial in a cube manner. How, how, how are we going to turn it down in, in terms of autonomous vehicle? I'm already thinking we should actually uh, create something that for a younger generation to live and trade and do things within a vehicle. Um, but somehow at the moment, the law and the order doesn't seem to cater for new inventions in that manner. So by running autonomous uh, uh, sort of shuttles in Science Park, I think that helps for our ecosystem, for people to actually see technologies actually make things possible, especially in our needs. We don't have enough space in Hong Kong. And again, things are so expensive uh, for us here in Hong Kong. It's very hard for our younger generation to even just pay for a mortgage, basically. And that's the reason why thinking multifunctional and um, monetized spatial in a way that really helps the situation, I think. Unlike you guys, you have mega, mega gardens and space, which is, uh, you know, which is wonderful. Uh, like, like, like your house, you know, Matthias, it's just great. But for us, we really have to look into different solutions to cater for our needs, basically. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, kind of Matthias, um, it seems everybody loves your ideas. Uh, how how does the world adopt your idea of the the smart city being its own compute? I mean, how, how, what what are your thoughts on getting into it? Because it's a kind of breakthrough idea. I mean, you've got both a financer on this call as well as a actual real builder on this call who are kind of intrigued with this. How do, how do you see? I know you you've led the adoption of many new technologies in Silicon Valley and around the world. Uh, how, how, do, how do we s s transition to this smart, say, actually it's a kind of smart building. It's not just smart, uh, we have to come up with a new word for it. <laughs> it's, the, it's the very smart, it's a, perhaps the very smart city. I think, I, I think that if we keep looking at the problems and thinking, okay, how does it adapt? And I mean, as Rosanna says, there's so many gains to do in making a something smart. Yes, there is. Optimization leads to profits, right? So we have that piece of the puzzle over here. But then we get to things like we're working on right now, which is like smart hospitals, mm -hmm. right? We're having th – this is a completely different story of optimizing things. We are optimizing human-computer interactions more than we are optimizing for profitability. We're trying to optimize – availability, convenience, um, you know, just personal feelings in reality. It's a design that goes outside of pure um, profit by saving energy, if I call it that. It, it, it leads to another kind of design and development. And there you are looking at regulatory. Each state has new different regulatory. Each country has different regulatory issues where it's very important as i mentioned that system runs without the internet it's an extremely important part because of course from a ransomware guy he would just say i'll just overload the internet and then your system goes down so he can just extort the hospital which of course we cannot have so it's extremely important to work there and of course the data privacy and everything like this so a city contains a lot of factors outside of buildings Right, so we can take sports arenas. We are working on a routing algorithm for guiding people how to drive their cars out of after a big game, right? Because it might just be wait three minutes. Maybe that's the whole thing you need in traffic <laughs> routing is not that we're going to route them better. We'll just tell them it's going to be faster if you wait three minutes and let these other guys go, right? It's, it's a different optimization. So when we work on 
the smart city. We work in the smart city as a simulation. We're running the whole city from harbor uh, deliveries to the entertainment industry to people going to the beach to a Saturday versus a Wednesday. How do we make the city a better place, right? As cities are growing, cities are today, our biggest possibility of building a sustainable world starts in the cities, right? That's where we can big, do the biggest impact in the shortest amount of time. Water, energy, super good things to do, right? I mean, that's really fantastic. If we could do that for all buildings, we are talking huge gains in cities, right? Um, the question right now is how do we bring this to a total entity? How do we create the smart city for real and how do we give it a voice, right? Because city needs a voice. It needs to talk to its citizens. It needs to be aware of what's going on. And and this is, um, there, there's a lot of pieces we're still exploring. Happily enough, we have a we have an infrastructure that is safe and private so we can explore all these service opportunities now, which comes on top of it. But I would say that, um, there is a combination of private and public still needed. It's going to be needed to have a conversation the whole time, just because there are so many private, uh, public things we still want to utilize. Like the, I want to use all the conduits, right? I don't want to build new conduits if they are in the city. I want to be able to do my cabling down there. I, you know, there, there's a lot of things I want to utilize that exists today. So I'm going to need to go hand in hand between private and public. But I'm seeing also, just as Floyd said, I'm seeing a much bigger um, acceptance to work with the private sector on these kind of projects, even though they are a challenge to negotiate. There is a lot of work that goes into that. Well, well, well um, obviously, uh, Rosanna has been very successful on the private sector of doing things I think a public sector would have never done, which is integrate the whole thing. But one uh, comment, Matthias, I want to kind of build on because it's an interesting insight, which is when you're talking about simulating the city to do the optimization, I guess the, the clever piece about your idea is you're using the compute in the city to simulate the city actually within the city and then all the systems optimize, which is kind of a, it's a kind of very nuanced, but a big breakthrough idea where the, the, the city is not just uh, aware, uh, as, but actually optimizing itself using its own systems without wow. talking on the internet to external systems. It's, it's a kind of revolutionary idea. It's an internal digital twin, we call it. No, that's right. right? So it's a di digital twin that is constantly optimizing itself by looking at different ways. That's why we have included in all our systems, we have um, built-in AI optimized hardware so we can use that as a utilization to try different algorithms as we go along. And as I said, in the whole city, it's really hard because you're gonna be optimizing for traffic flow versus <laughs> entertainment versus Saturdays where everything behaves different, right? So you have a lot of different optimizations which are different between different cities also. So the system has to be built in such a way that it's interoperable, not just with technology, but dynamic interoperability with humans, right? It, it's all about human computer interaction in the end, right? That's why we're building smart cities is to achieve the possibility of becoming sustainable and that of course is it's that that is also optimizing for cost, right? And ROI. Yeah. But there is the part that it's all in the end about humans. Without humans, we don't have any business anyway. So it doesn't really that's why Hong Kong is interesting because it's so compact, right? Um, yeah. but, I used to I, live I, in I a very the, small apartment there. It was very yeah. but, but I, I guess I the uh, going back to the theme of this session, which is about digital privacy, I guess one of the, the insights you're bringing is the way to make a smart city truly private is let the buildings and even the apartments do their own computation versus giving it all to a cloud far away, which opens it up to ransomware attacks as the apartment, you know, so you're saying not just the building is a compute unit, the apartments are compute units talking to the other apartments in each one because it's doing its own processing is inherently private. They don't have to disclose who's in the apartment. They can just say, I need energy 
or my air conditioner is, is uh, you know, needs more power, or I have power I'm not using, does someone else in the apartment building want it? So that that's kind of like a, it's a kind of a, what's the word, a democratization, or it's, it, it's creating a market economy for everything in the building, and the buildings now can communicate with other buildings and share resources. If that, if, if I kind of understand your vision. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all about that we look at things that are today siloed and we make them dynamic. That's, that's basically what you gain with an autonomous uh, decentralized system, right? Each piece lives its own life and can either be consumed here or offers itself up for being consumed by somebody else. That yeah. was system architecture talk with saying consumed. We talk about consumed data, but uh, sorry. So, so Floyd, so what do you think about this approach that Matthias is talking about where truly everything is a tradable asset? Uh, you know, the, 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 the power, the information, the, 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 the building, the apartments, that they're all trading with each other. Is, uh, as an investor, what's your kind of like gut reaction to that? Well, I, I mean, I think that it's, it's- where we have to go as we have diminishing resources. Uh, You know, we have diminishing natural resources that are taking place. And so what we have to do in everything that we look at, whether we're building a building or creating a system within a smart city, whatever it is, is how do we maximize the utilization for the benefit of the people who live there? You know, how, how do we utilize fewer resources, natural resources, and turn those into a benefit for human resources. And, and that's what all, all three of us are doing, right, on a daily basis. When, if you really take a step back and think about it, uh, we're saying how do we maximize the utilization of what we have uh, and share that with others that have not in order to create a better community? That's really what we're trying to do. And we're coming at it from different perspectives but we're all with the same objective at the end of the day. Great. So kind of the last word, Rosanna, with you, uh, as, as you are one of the premier uh, builders in the world of the smart buildings, kind of would love your vision. What, what can we look forward to? I mean, we've heard uh, voice protect a perspective as well as Mateus in terms of, uh, you know, w- the opportunity for buildings that actually manage themselves uh and and actually our uh we we need a new term we need the very smart and independent smart building uh you know to ca- kind of capture <laughs> uh just kind of as a closing thought uh, what do you see as the potential of this kind of vision and and uh what what kind of insights would you want to share with the kind of global community on uh what we should think about or aspire to or hope for as we create these new buildings, which I, I know you're actually, you're actually building these new buildings. I would kind of love your thought. What do you see in the next five, 10 year horizon? I, I personally think uh, I, I love simulations. I simulate everything that we do in terms okay. of traffic flow, people flow, our sort of solar energy, so on and so forth. Um, again, we have so many technologies that we can use. I think that's benefit of what we do, but, at the end of the day, to me, is a balance between technologies and people. Whatever we're trying to do is really designed for our people or within our community. But because our nature in Hong Kong is so small and so compact in a, in a way that at the moment, whatever we're trying to do, we not only optimize the solutions that we have within the building, but also the, the this whole project site. For instance, the the landscape area, the communal area, all the spatial, external and and internal, how we can actually monetize that and, and optimize that for our people to live in and enjoy living in with that inclusiveness as well, not just, you know, sort of wealthy people, but also just day-to-day life citizens can actually can actually use that. But again, mm-hmm. I think one more thing is very important to us is also the feedback loop. I think we've got to listen mm-hmm. to the end user, our clients, our people, to give us the feedback. And the more feedback we have, and to actually pay eye into all these informations that we have, again, I think we will have a chance to build a a better city, basically, for our people. Not just for us, for the next generation. I think that's very important. Great. Anyway, thanks for that. 
uh, the uh, session is now over. Uh, thanks for the uh, uh, for Aces community, and thanks for our fantastic panelists uh, to sharing their great insight. Thank you again for everybody. Thanks, Janae. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Talk, Bye -bye. Soon. Thanks. Talk, talk Bye -bye. soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.